Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is You from the North. We're talking about solutions for our major social problems and comparing between the U.S. and Canada. How do these problems differ? Canada. Uh, with our uh, Dr. Ken Rogers, our esteemed guest from Kelowna, British Columbia. Welcome to the show, Ken. Hello, Jay. So let's let's talk about uh, so what are social problems and are we are we more aware of social problems these days, or could it be that there are more social problems to deal with? You know, I, I don't remember a big discussion of this when I was a kid. I wonder if you do. Um, you know, there were people who were disadvantaged, of course, but it, it was not so prominent an issue then, I think, as it is now. Have things gotten better or worse? Are they the same? Well, I think they're worse. Uh, I think certainly the public's more aware of it. But when you come down to solutions, you know, which is a good way to start, is to me there's only four ways you could solve a social problem. You either have a um, government policy or legislative thing. You have the courts make a decision, uh, or you have a charity, or you have a vote. You know, by a vote, I mean, for example, in Ohio, they voted in favor of of um, having abortions. You know, so that uh, you get those four. Um, ways of solving a problem, which then, when you just stand back from that, that would give you a quick explanation as to the major differences between Canada and the United States. Because how those four solutions are dealt with are quite different. And, you know, the key factor in the difference is... Um, um, let's say, Citizens United, you know, where uh, your political side in the United States is much less democratic than Canada. And by the much less, it's because you, you have such a major influence in everything to do with elections by big money, by dirty money. Uh, similarly, the courts in the United States are essentially politi politicized uh, so that you don't have the same way that a social problem is, um, is dealt with. Um, you know what? One good example um, is the United States has a, a ridiculous um, uh, prison population. You've got a huge number of people in the United States um, in prison uh, because of minor marijuana infractions, where marijuana is legalized in, you know, quite a few states now. Um, you know, but really, you know, I don't know how you're going to solve that. You know, you need you know, a general pardon for for any marijuana dispute or something or. However, um, I don't know if you see the U.S. as less democratic than, than Canada in terms of its ability to solve social crises or not. Well, I, I have a couple of thoughts about that. You know, I, I, when you get down to it, it's, uh, it's a matter of caring for your neighbor. It's a matter of a, of a social society which, where people care for their neighbors. And in the days of Northern Rockwell, you know, the 30s, the 40s, the cover of the that evening post, um, you know, all the all the art that he did reflected caring for your family, caring for your neighbor. Uh, there were no negative um, vectors in any of that. And I mean, right now, I'd have, I'd have to say there are a lot of negative vectors in the United States. Um, and there is an emergence of, a, and I call it a Republican uh, kind of mentality, which is uh, something about, I got mine. I don't care if you have yours. Um, and if you have to starve on the street, it's not my problem. Um, and I think we see that, and increasingly so. And Trump is an example of that. Um, and, and so that's the whole notion of uh, uh, not caring. 
of not caring about your neighbor. But on the other hand, I, I don't know how to make I don't know how to make sense of this. I saw a movie on YouTube which was very very interesting it was about a young fellow out of um, I guess it was out of California who decided he was going to ride across the country on a spike uh, with uh, the, the purpose of trying to find out how people felt about each other, whether they were kind and caring about their neighbor and about him. And uh, he, he went without money, um, without food. Uh, it was a test to see whether he would find charity among the people he ran into. And he crossed the country both uh, from the west to the east and then back again to the west. And he filmed his interactions with people. And what you found uh, invariably in those interactions were that people who represented capital concentrations didn't care, were not going to help him, were not going to provide him with food or water or, or any kind of assistance. But people who had nothing, people who were homeless, who were disadvantaged, they helped them as a matter of human kind. And it happened over and over again, so much so that you could, you know, draw some conclusions about that. So I think that the power, the power elite, and perhaps the middle class is in the category. I, I really don't care about my neighbor these days. Um, but the disadvantage, they care. It's really a strange place we've come to. Um, query: Does that make sense to you? Does it make sense in Canada? Yes, it does, and and I would um, think of that in a slightly different slant or a way to help describe it is is um, what's in the common good versus what's my, in my individual interest. And if you take a simple example that occurs in every city in in Canada and the United States is is there's a piece of land that is needed for a road or a an interchange or for expansion of a hospital or some public good purpose, but some individual has owns that property and doesn't want to give it up, and that the public good enables that that property can be expropriated, and fairness usually applies, and they get reasonable compensation. You know, the person is all whose property is expropriated will grumble about that and so on. But when you move that to a, a state or provincial or federal level, um, you suddenly get a different picture, you know, and, and that um, ties in with your comment about the wealthy. Uh, those that have, you know, sort of say, keep your hands off, go away. I don't care about anybody else. Leave me alone. Um, you know, they uh, they want their individual rights to outrank the public good. You know, on the simplest example in, in the United States uh, might be the, um, you know, abortion or, uh, you know, you can have guns. You know, what is in the public good in terms of, you know, um, assault rifles or assault weapons? Now, Canada has a ban on assault weapons um, where we were able to get, you know, what's in the public good trumps individual rights. You know, in the U.S., you know, the um, Citizens United type of, of effect where money decides items and so you end up with an individual right trumps what's in the public good. Uh, now, if you're trying to say, you know, how do you solve it? You, know, you, you really need to reverse Citizens United. You need to stop politicizing the courts. Um, you, <clears throat> you need to get so that uh, elected officials do not have their first loyalty to some big money backer. But instead, you know, they really rely on the on the public, whose public good therefore should be ranked ahead of the interests of the very wealthy individual. Yeah, but at the fundamental level, it's caring, isn't it? 
You have to have yes. the people of the population, the citizenry, the electorate care. And I, I think we've lost that. It's not well, it's the politician. Does the politician care? That's exactly the the issue. You, you've got um, if you know they have a uh, wealthy pack that has uh, financed their very expensive political campaign in the U.S. Uh, as opposed to in Canada, where you have very short periods of time for uh, elections and and big money and and unions and corporations are just not invo- not able to make contributions of any meaningful amount uh then you know the politician's responsibility clearly uh you know relates to the individuals you know what's good for his electorate you know that's just not the case in the United States and you almost have the same with judges. I mean, I, I think of this um, Eileen Cannon uh, as as sort of an absurd case of of how, you know, it just looks like you know she has a debt to Donald Trump or a debt to for being appointed and and the uh, uh, the uh, system by which the Republicans get. Judges appointed based on their biases, <laughs> and, and so you know you really get to what looks like obviously a, a lack of proper uh, dealing by a judge. So you would differentiate the level of caring in Canada uh, as against the level of caring in the U.S. No, uh, it, it depends if you if you're talking about. At an individual level, I think virtually Canadians and Americans are, are virtually the same. You know, if you were to take, uh, you know, one of the ways of solving social problems, you know, the Salvation Army, it's exactly the same in the United States as it is in Canada. It's still, it's the Salvation Army in both cases. They deal with the social problems exactly the same way. Um, you know, it's really, um, you know, you, you've you got basic differences in the United States versus Canada. You know, we do not have a, you know, major uh, portion of our population that's non-white. Now, we still have Islamophobia. Um, you know, we still have, you know, problems with uh, immigration, you know, particularly clearly illegal immigration. Uh, however, um, you know, the scale of some of these things are different. Um, do you have a capital punishment in Canada? Not really. <laughs> no, no. Because you know, there's a, there's a, 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 an execution supposed to happen like this week of um, a guy uh, in Alabama and and they tried to uh, inject him with poison a couple of years ago, but it didn't work, and he was in pain, and and people were not happy with that. So they're experimenting on a on a new way of executing prisoners in uh, in uh, Alabama. And uh, it's by the way, just a footnote: it's it's giving him a, a mask of nitrogen, which actually you know de- deprives him of oxygen. And he dies for oxygen starvation. Anyway, um, there's a you know a tumult going on. People watch. You know, there's no federal ban on it. In fact, I, I'm not. I think maybe the federal government still permits a uh, uh, capital punishment. Um, and we really have to get by that. I mean, it reflects a certain morality uh, that we should. It is barbaric, and you when you compare it to uh, other countries like. Canada and and uh, and Europe, most of Western Europe, all of which doesn't have capital punishment, and they have a, a very enlightened system, and and they don't have as many prisoners stuck away in jails for minor offenses as we have. So it all reflects a level of caring. But then you get these various aspects of the let me call it the social safety net. You've mentioned some of them: poverty, joblessness, homelessness. Racism, inequality, immigration, of course, healthcare, education, abortion. 
I'm sure there are some others we could name. And uh, I think some of those things you mentioned, Canada is ahead of us. Um, for example, I, isn't abortion permitted in Canada? It's nationally permitted. Um, and, um, you know, we even have uh, health care that pays for it. Yeah, you have a commendable health care system. And, um, well, it's not perfect. No, it never for sure. Uh, you know, you can, uh, uh, you know, what you have when you have the public purse paying for your health care, then you have, you know, some lady wants to have plastic surgery and thinks that that should be covered by the public health care, you know, which is not, you know, the, however, uh, you know, you, you have an endless push for the public health care to cover more and more and more, you know, where uh, the politicians tend to, uh, let's say in Canada right now, one of the key things is uh, is uh, at the federal level, because it's a, uh, takes two parties together to, you know, have the control of the government. Well, the minor of those two parties is the is the furthest left wing in Canada, very Bernie Bernie Sanders level of of left wing, and they want to, to have the Canadian healthcare system, uh, you know, pay for dental care, you know, and and fairly elaborately, where, you know, the public would criticize the Canadian healthcare system is that. It is that you have some unreasonable wait times for some types of things like a knee surgery or hip surgery because, you know, those aren't essential for somebody's life. Um, you know, there is no wait time if you need, you know, heart surgery or, you know, you arrive at the hospital and you have some, you know, exotic infection, they handle it immediately. And it doesn't matter what the cost is, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, my brother uh, arrived at a hospital in Vancouver a few years ago, and uh, fortunately, um, his wife uh, recognized that, uh, you know, he had symptoms, symptoms that were similar to polio. She was a child physiotherapist in her early days, and, and she says, well, he doesn't have polio polio, but it's perhaps it's Guillain-Barre. And, and the treatments for Guillain-Barre are like, you know, $10,000 a click, you know, and, and, and it was, he was just treated instantly, no hesitation, you know, a dangerous thing where, you know, out in the lobby, somebody may be sitting there grumbling because they got to wait in line for hip surgery or from somebody to assess what, how their cure for their common cold is coming along. Uh, but, um, you know, there's criticism of the Canadian healthcare system, but there is no politician in Canada would dare to say they want to, you know, take it away, you know, which in the U.S. that's very prominent, you know, that we should, you know, the Republicans want to kick out um, Obamacare. That just, to a Canadian, that's just straight insanity. Yeah, and, and there are some states that, don't, that, that do not encourage. In fact, they, they have not agreed to allow Obamacare uh, registrations in their states. It's incredible. And it's, it can only be a good thing for people, but they still don't want the benefits to flow to the disadvantage. So, you know, if you look at it, healthcare, I mean, I know there are issues that Issues in the National Health Service in Britain also, um, but but the fact is that the worst of all of all of these is is the U.S. Not necessarily in terms of finding a brilliant doctor with a brilliant education and a brilliant record to have to do some really exotic surgery on you. Not that because money and connections will get you that. Um, I'm talking about the guy in uh, let me pick Alabama again, uh, who doesn't get any health care. At all, zero, and and there are people in Congress who would like to cut off Medicare. Also, 
So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, on that one, you know, you'll have to agree with me that whatever is going on in Canada is better than, for the average Joe, is better than in the U.S. There are huge numbers of people who simply don't get health care, and they die. And there are those in the political spectrum, many of them, who like that. That's what they want to see. They don't want this individual. And their theory, sort of like Trump, is if, if he was a better person, he'd have more money. And if he had more money, he'd have more health care. It's his fault. Okay, that, that's, that pervades uh, this notion of I got mine and I don't care if you get yours. But let's well, talk about it. Go ahead. I, I agree with you only to a certain extent. You know, if you're a, a moderately wealthy individual, let's let's say you're, you know, a, a chiropractor, a dentist, a, a lawyer, a, a medical doctor. You're not you're not a billionaire. You, you're not a multimillionaire, but you've got you know you're not suffering financially. Your medical care in the United States would be better than in Canada. And the reason for that is, is you lay down a couple bucks and you can get your knee surgery done right away. Your wife can have her plastic surgery. You know, you can have your hip surgery. You can have whatever you want very quickly, you know, but you pay for it. In Canada, that level of wealth doesn't get you diddly squat. You know, the, the, Multi multi millionaire, they can in Canada, they can afford to go to Mayo Clinic and bump off somebody else for priority and, and get whatever they want, you know. But but you've got that upper middle class level of person in the United States um, that um, you know really is a very influential block of of the public, which is necessary to perpetuate the American system or the, or the stupidity in the health system, you know, in my mind, because they don't worry, they don't have a problem, you know, and, well, let's you move know, so, to... so, but a, as a generalization for, for the majority of the population, the Canadian system is far better for, for health care than the U.S. Let's, let's go to the, the next topic, which actually wraps around healthcare in many ways, and it's just poverty. It's people who are stuck. Um, people who are stuck in Alabama and all those states around there in the South where they can never make a good living, where they can't get an abortion, uh, and they wind up with a big family they can't afford, uh, where, where uh, they wind up homeless. It's so easy to be homeless in this country because the cost of housing is, is so steep. Um, and, and then, you know, you wind up on the street. Now I know, you know, we've talked before about some of the Canadian cities like Vancouver, that are a lot of people on the street, but I think it's the metric for the society, the percentage of people on the street, the percentage of people who can't eat, they don't have enough money for food. Uh, there are no federal programs to take care of them. Um, I believe that Canada has some programs may be better. I don't know. You'll have to tell me. Um, but dealing with poverty is a huge problem. And it, of course, we had poverty in the 30s. You know, the whole uh, okiarchy moved to uh, California and the, the dustbin of the Middle West. Um, people were really poor. Um, but they all climbed out of it. And the war got people better off somehow in the 50s and the 60s. But somewhere along the way, we started seeing homeless. We started seeing poverty on the street in our own neighborhoods, uh, affecting uh, civil society. And it seems to be increasing. And the question is, uh, how much of a metric is it? And, and how well is Canada doing vis-a-vis -vis the U.S.? Well, Canada has a much better social safety net than the United States does. Um, you know, our unemployment insurance uh, is easier to obtain and it lasts for a longer period of time and the amount is greater. Um, we have, um, for example, um, 
anybody who has any kind of job is required uh, at, as a payroll deduction to pay into uh, the Canada pension plan. We have a national pension plan and we have a, you know, old age security that automatically clicks in, uh, you know, if you're over a certain age, uh, usually 65, but you can do things to get that adjusted. Um, and so that, you know, your, your seniors are generally better off because they've paid into this obligated pension plan system, you know, or compulsory pension plan system. And also, uh, you know, they get their old age security. Um, the, you know, at the other end of the scale, you know, younger people, um, you know, we got the same problems as the U S in the sense that you've got, um, the lack of institutions for uh, the mentally ill. We've got a lack of institutions, uh, institutionalized places for any kinds of addiction, whether they're drugs or alcohol or some combination, you know, and, you know, in my mind, um, you know, the majority of, of people living on the street have some combination of uh, drug addiction, alcoholism, addiction, or mental illness, you know, which makes them reasonably unemployable. And, you know, they've had with those problems enough length of time that their social safety net benefits tend to start to run out, uh, even though the Canadian benefits last longer than the, those in the U.S., now, you mentioned Vancouver, um, you know, and you also mentioned uh, Mississippi or no, Alabama. Well, if you're homeless in Alabama, you're in a lot better shape than if you're homeless in Edmonton, Alberta. Well, I don't just, well, it was uh, 40 degrees below zero in Edmonton last week. <laughs> <laughs> and and the reason that Vancouver has a fair amount of, of uh, street people is that, uh, you know, people have gone who are in that uh, mode, let's call it, or in that condition, they have purposely moved from, you know, uh, Manitoba, Alberta, and Saskatchewan to the west coast of Canada because, you know, in the winter, you know, like it's rarely below zero in in Vancouver and Vancouver Island um and you know it's much like the same weather as Seattle you know Seattle has better weather than Montana or or Minneapolis you know or Chicago you know it's you know even though it may be a higher latitude than Chicago or Denver it's still a lot better weather all around it's certainly for the homeless person. So Vancouver, you know, just gets a, a little bit extra dose of, <laughs> from, from its neighbors. Uh, but generally I would guess that the mess in terms of homelessness is very similar between Canada and the United States. Uh, yeah. So it's really interesting how, when we were kids, uh, yeah, sure. There were hobos riding the freight trains out of the thirties. And, uh, you know, there were, there were bums in the Bowery, whatnot, but not to the same degree, not so visible, not so tear your heart out. Um, now we have so oh, many thousands and thousands, tens of thousands here in Honolulu. And, uh, I'm sure the same, you know, in any major city, not only in Canada, but in Europe, everywhere. I don't think they permit that though in China or Japan. Um, so it really depends on the government and, and that ultimately depends on how the government feels about a safety net, uh, whether it should be kind or maybe not so kind, but you get them off the street anyway. All this raises the question, Ken, of, um, of, of migration. Migration, say, from, uh, from the United States to Canada. There were people back in 2016, 2017, said, oh my God, Trump is going to be president. I got to get out of here. He revealed himself pretty early in the game and and there were people who were, you know, trying to get to Canada because they felt that Canada was a more liberal, caring, if you will, 
place where you can have a better life. Um, on the other hand, you don't qualify for these social safety net benefits so easily. Uh, I think you have to be a permanent resident of Canada before you qualify. And so it's not like everybody can walk over the border and have the benefit of these social safety net elements. Um, but query, you know, what's it like? When I, in, in reviewing things for this show, I stumbled into a number of websites that said, come on up to Canada. You'll like it here. Even if it's, even if it's cold, you'll like it. Um, and, and politically, I, I think I would like it. But I, I wonder if it would like me. Um, well, it it depends on uh, who you are. For uh, you know, what came to my mind right away was was when you do international traveling. Very often, you will find, um, or I found, um, that Americans would tell everybody they were Canadian. And it was, you know, to a great extent, you know, and maybe I have a biased way of saying it, is that, um, you know, Americans are perceived in many travel locations, like in the Caribbean and South America, in that um, they're very, very arrogant, very pompous, uh, you know, very loud, pushy, you know, they're you know, and the image of Canadians are polite and cordial, you know, and, and less pushy. And, and so that, you know, they're treated, as you say, uh, you know, the poor person treats the guy traveling across the U.S. Uh, better than, uh, you know, the wealthy person. And, and, you know, that travel response was kind of an interesting one uh, is, um, uh, and it comes, uh, you know, it, it in my mind feeds back to the general overall feel of um, of why uh, the U.S. has um, a pushier side for individual rights should trump the public good, you know, and I can do what I want and. If I've got enough money to travel, I can tell everybody to stick it and scream and be boorish if I feel like it. And, and uh, you know, the average Canadian just doesn't do that. Well, um, could I come to Canada and take advantage of that? Uh, could I come to Canada and have the social safety net and all these uh, retirement benefits you're talking about, the health benefits you're talking about? Um, the welfare, welfare services. Um, could I have that? Or is that, you, that close to me as a, no, you yeah. hasn't been there that long. Well, you, you can have all the benefits in Canada, um, if you meet certain steps, you know, it's easier to become a Canadian citizen than it is to become an American citizen. It's easier to get landed immigrant status in Canada than it is in the U.S. Now, Canada, in a lot of ways, if you think of, say, New Zealand, you know, New Zealand doesn't have a, a great immigration problem. You know, and that's because, you know, it's out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You know, you, you, know, you can't get there. Canada, to a great extent, is, is in that same thing. We don't have a long border with Mexico that people can walk across. We got an extremely long bar border with the United States, you know, but people don't. And it's an unguarded border to a great extent for the entire length of it. And it's not really a problem to either Canada or the U.S. People just don't walk across either way. You know, there's the concern of, you know, moving drugs uh, one way or the other, you know, if it's, or they're moving guns from the U.S. to Canada. But, uh, you know, generally, uh, if you are an American, you know, it's easier to get um, immigration into Canada than it is the other way around. Like, to be a, a you know, the U.S., it has a painful steps to go through. You know, you get 
from a, a green card is one thing, but people can be on green cards for 10 years and still don't qualify for citizenship in Canada. That's, it's an easier process to get to where you're, you're fully a Canadian citizen with all the rights that everybody else has. We don't have a whole bunch of these in-between categories. Well, you're selling me on the social side of it. You know, there's not nearly as much racism and inequality. Immigration's not a problem. Abortion's not a problem. And I understand there's some great uh, institutions of higher education all across Canada, which don't have the same problems we've been seeing in Congress uh, lately. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the Canadians, the Canadian government, uh, and I suppose the uh, provinces, which in many ways govern, you know, the people in that province, um, is is actually doing better for the average, the average Joe. It's it's a more democratic country, isn't it? And and you know, the result is that if you had to make a choice, you would want to do that. Are people doing that? Are they coming over the border? Are they settling and starting businesses and lives? Uh, in British Columbia? Uh, there are lots of Americans moving to Canada, but there are also lots of Canadians moving to the U.S. Now, usually the, the Canadians that are moving to the U.S., you know, are usually reasonably well-educated people that that they're working for Amazon in Canada. And then, you know, because they're talented, they move them to Dallas or San Francisco or somewhere and uh, and uh, just for economic opportunity, people move back and forth. Um, the, you know, like Canada has a higher taxes for an individual than in the U.S., you know, so a lot of the uh, advantages for individuals depends on what is your education and what is your income and therefore what will your net standard of living be in one place as opposed to another. You know, if you're in the in the bottom 50%, you're sure better off in Canada than you are in the U.S. If you're in the, in the you know, second to the 10th percentile, you probably do just as well or better in the United States. Yeah. We have to make these comparisons, don't we, though? Uh, especially now in in the throes of an unknown administration uh, starting. When you say, well, when you use unknown administration, it, it's interesting as a little sideline on, you know, social issue or what's in the public good. The uh, federal government just had sort of, uh, you know, a panic meeting of, of all of their uh, members of parliament and, uh, on the uh, thing of um, what will we do if Trump wins? Just sheer panic. Oh, <laughs> well, I think that's happening all over the world. As a yes. fact, we're having a show on that very question vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe uh, on Thursday this week. So it's a very interesting question, and I am happy to hear that people are alert and uh, federal government is alert uh, to the fact that things will change on day one. Uh, if and when he is elected. Well, well, if you use that, you know, it's a bit of an aside from, from our social safety net, but, you know, we're talking about, you know, as a um, social problem, you know, as if our, uh, from a Canadian point of view, if our best neighbor, you know, where we share, you know, I don't know how many miles, 10,000 miles of border, et cetera, Suddenly, you know, uh, goes into a uh, heavy, a, you know, high tariff mode. You know, well, Canada buys, you know, an awful lot of its food from the United States. You know, let's say California produces uh, probably all, you know, 90% of the green vegetables that Canadians eat. Well, if you suddenly, you know, stop buying Canadian goods, then we can't buy anything back. 
You know, you know it, it's, but it's not only that. It, it, you know, you say it's uh, it not it's off the path of our inquiry into social safety net, but not not really. You know, when I started to uh, uh, look at the web for uh, materials to shape the sh issues in the show, I found uh, I found some studies uh, comparing specifically comparing uh, social programs in Canada and the U.S. And they were hundreds of pages long by, by very credible organizations. And uh, that comparison has to, has to go on. We know from this discussion they're not exactly the same. But we know also that you look across the border, see what's going on, and maybe there's something we can learn. Something Canada can learn from the U.S. And more important, what the U.S. can learn from Canada. I think that's a better inquiry right there. If Trump is elected, and it's right for the federal government to consider what might change. The social safety net in this country will change. And that will probably have an effect on other countries. Don't you agree? I do. But, you know, the United States isn't uniform. Uh, one of the most fantastic places in the United States is Utah. You know, the, you know, sometimes uh, I've heard Americans pick fun at uh, or make jabs at the Mormon religion. But but when you used your example of the fellow crossing the United States with his bicycle and who would help them, you know, the, you know, as I started in, uh, at the first of this um, discussion by saying that uh, one of the key methods of, uh, of handling social problems is charity. Well, the Mormon Church in Utah really pushes very heavily a uh, a neighborhood system where the neighborhood works really closely together. And if if somebody loses their job, you know there are you know two or three people that are qualified in the area of that person that the local stake or what they call it, let's call it the local church, um, those people bear a responsibility to help that person find a job. They show up at the, at the person's house and <laughs> check out whether they've got a, a pantry with enough food and how the kids are doing. And, and it, there's a, you know, a self-help Society that is just quite fantastic, uh, you know. When you I, I lived that, in... that is so interesting because you mentioned at the very outset of the show, Ken, that one of the uh, institutions in in any democratic government is going to be the religious community, the community and the religious community both. And of course, you know, the Mormon Church is doing this to proselytize new members and 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 look good. But, you know, it, what it demonstrates, among other things, demonstrates many things, but what it demonstrates is that government, people assume government's going to take care of them, and they're wrong. Government isn't going to take care of them. Different countries, different levels, but in general, democratic governments can only go so far uh, for many reasons, except in Scandinavia. It's different in Scandinavia. <laughs> but but let, me, let me say that it's, it's a great point to end the show to say that um, when you talk about the Mormons, when you talk about religion helping, this is in many religions around the world, it's because government there isn't doing its job, uh, at least in part. Anyway, Ken, uh, sorry we don't have more time. Uh, thank you very much for this important discussion. I really appreciate it. Well, al aloha from Western Canada, <laughs> where it's pretty cold this week. <laughs> aloha from Hawaii, where it's quite beautiful. Thank you very much, Ken. Ken Rogers, retired Canadian businessman in Alona, British Columbia. Thank you.